Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today we are going to continue our Winter is Coming series by beginning our analysis of Ariane's second pre-release chapter. In our videos on her first pre-release chapter, we outlined just how ridiculous this mission is that Duran has laid before her, and how he seems to have set her up to fail just like he did with his brother Oberon in King's Landing and his son Quentin in Slaver's Bay. As Ariane is not only unqualified to treat with a man like John Connington, but the people Duran sent with her have no business being there either, and bring absolutely nothing to the table. We also learned that she is completely unprepared, and knows nothing about John Connington, except the few borderline useless pieces of information that Damon Sand gave her on their travels. Coming up in this video, we are going to pick up right where we left off, with Ariane and her merry band of useless idiots, as they land on Cape Wrath and begin their journey to Griffin's Roost. So, let's do this. All along the south coast of Cape Wrath rose crumbling stone watchtowers, raised in ancient days to give warning of Dornish raiders stealing in across the sea. Villages had grown up about the towers. A few had flowered into towns. This seems a bit odd, because the Dornish are not known as a seafaring people. George has even been quoted as saying that there are boats in Dorne, but not many of them are their own. So why the southern coast of Cape Wrath is lined with watchtowers that are there to give warning against Dornish seafaring raiders doesn't really make any sense. If she was claiming that they were there to give warning against pirates from the Stepstones, that would make sense. So maybe she's wrong, or maybe she just is a little bit confused. The Peregrine made port at the Weeping Town where the corpse of the young dragon had once lingered for three days on its journey home from Dorne. The banners flapping from the town's stout wooden walls still displayed King Tommen's stag and lion, suggesting that here, at least, the writ of the Iron Throne might still hold sway. Guard your tongues, Ariane warned her company as they disembarked. It would be best if King's Landing never knew we'd passed this way. Should Lord Connington's rebellion be put down, it would go ill for them if it was known that Dorne had sent her to treat with him and his pretender. That was another lesson her father had taken pains to teach her. Choose your side with care, and only if they have the chance to win. They had no trouble buying horses, though the cost was five times what it would have been last year. They're old, but sound, claimed the hostler. You'll not find better this side of Storm's End. The Griffin's men seize every horse and mule they come upon. Oxen, too. Some will make a mark upon paper if you ask for payment, but there's others who would just as soon cut your belly open and pay you with a handful of your own guts. If you come across any such... Mind your tongues and give the horses up. The town was large enough to support three inns, and all their common rooms were rife with rumors. Ariane sent her men into each of them to hear what they might hear. In the broken shield, Damon Sand was told that the great sceptre on the Hulf of Men had been burned and looted by raiders from the sea and a hundred young novices from the mother house on Maiden Isle carried off into slavery. In the loon, Joss Hood learned that half a hundred men and boys from the Weeping Town had set off north to join John Connington at Griffin's Roost, including young Sir Adam, old Lord Whitehead's son and heir. But in the aptly named Drunken Dornishman, Feathers heard men muttering that the griffin had put Red Ronnet's brother to death 
and raped his maiden sister. Ronnet himself was said to be rushing south to avenge his brother's death and his sister's dishonor. Okay, so it is very likely that the man selling the horses is a liar. Because if the Golden Company was really going around taking every single horse and threatening to kill anyone who doesn't turn theirs over, where the heck did he get his horses from that he's selling? It seems far more likely that he's using this story as a means of overcharging for his crappy horses that he has for sale. Then there's the stories coming out of the inns. Damon Sand was told that the sceptery on the Hall of Men was looted, and a mother house was raided and the girls were taken into slavery. This seems likely to have been perpetrated by the Volantines, as Danny's disruption of the slave trade has them angry enough to go to war, and they likely saw this as an opportunity to get paid for their trip home. The other noteworthy aspect of what Damon heard is the fact that George placed this sceptery at a place called the Half of Man. Half is a word that seemingly has no easily found definition. But in the town of Half in Iceland, there is a famous partially underground church, which leads us to believe that George drew inspiration from this and placed this sceptery on the Half of Man because this particular sceptery might be at least partially underground. In the Loon, Joss Hood hears that 50 Weeping Town men led by Adam Whitehead, the Lord of Weeping Town's son, are heading north to join John Connington. This seems likely to be true. But at the Drunken Dornishman, pure lies are being spread. John Connington confided his cousins to their chambers and killed and raped none of them. And Red Ronnet may or may not be on his way to try to retake Griffin's Roost. But it is not known. This wide array of rumors that are going around, however, is exactly the type of confusion that John Connington was hoping would follow their landing, so it would seem that his plan is working. That night, Ariane dispatched the first of her ravens back to Dorne, reporting to her father on all they'd seen and heard. The next morning, her company set out for Mistwood, as the first rays of the rising sun were slanting through the peaked roofs and crooked alleys of the Weeping Town. By mid-morning, a light rain began to fall, as they were making their way north through a land of green fields and little villages. As yet, they had seen no signs of fighting, but all the other travelers along the rutted road seemed to be going in the other direction and the women in the villages they passed gazed at them with wary eyes and kept their children close. Further north, the fields gave way to rolling hills and thick groves of old forest. The road dwindled to a track, and villages became less common. Dusk found them on the fringes of the rainwood, a wet green world where brooks and rivers ran through dark forests and the ground was made of mud and rotting leaves. Huge willows grew along the watercourses, larger than any that Ariane had ever seen, their great trunks as gnarled and twisted as an old man's face, and festooned with beards of silvery moss. Trees pressed close on every side, shutting out the sun. Hemlock and red cedars, white oaks, soldier pines that stood as tall and straight as towers, colossal sentinels, big leaf maples, redwoods, worm trees, even here and there a wild weirwood. Underneath their tangled branches, ferns and flowers grew in profusion. Sword ferns, lady ferns, bell flowers and piper's lace, evening stars and poison kisses, Liverwort, lungwort, hornwort. Mushrooms sprouted down amongst the tree roots, and from their trunks as well. Pale spotted hands that caught the rain. Other trees were furred with moss, green or gray or red-tailed, and once a vivid purple. Lichens covered every rock and stone, Toadstools festered besides rotting logs. The very air seemed green. 
This seems as good a time as any to mention that the Rainwood is a small part of what used to be a massive forest that stretched from here on Cape Wrath all the way up to Cape Kraken. And as you can see from the description, this is no ordinary forest. It's filled with some of the largest trees in existence, from redwoods and sequoias, which are hundreds of feet tall, to big leaf maples and white oaks, which are by comparison smaller, but still routinely grow to be over a hundred feet tall. Now, while the canopy above very much resembles the redwood forest in California, down on the forest floor, it has a very rainforest feel to it, which leads us directly into Ariane's next thought. Ariane had once heard her father and Maester Calliot arguing with a septon about why the north and south sides of the Sea of Dorne were so different. The septon thought it was because of Duran Godsgrief, the first Storm King, who had stolen the daughter of the Sea God and the Goddess of the Wind, and earned their eternal enmity. Prince Doran and the Maester inclined more toward wind and water, and spoke of how the big storms that formed down in the summer sea would pick up moisture moving north until they slammed into Cape Wrath. For some strange reason, the storms never seemed to strike at dawn. she recalled her father saying. I know your reason, the Septon had responded. No Dornishman ever stole away the daughter of two gods. The going was much slower here than it had been in Dorn. Instead of proper roads, they rode down crookback slashes that snaked this way and that, through clefts in huge moss-covered rocks, and down deep ravines choked with blackberry brambles. Sometimes the track petered out entirely, sinking into bogs or vanishing amongst the ferns, leaving Ariane and her companions to find their own way amongst the silent trees. The rain still fell, soft and steady. The sound of moisture dripping off the leaves was all around them, and every mile or so, the music of another little waterfall would call to them. The wood was full of caves as well. That first night, they took shelter in one of them to get out of the wet. In Dorn, they had often traveled after dark, when the moonlight turned the blowing sands to silver. But the rainwood was too full of bogs, ravines, and sinkholes, and black as pitch beneath the trees, where the moon was just a memory. Feathers made a fire and cooked a brace of hares that Sir Garibald had taken with some wild onions and mushrooms he had found along the road. After they ate, Elia Sand turned a stick and some dry moss into a torch and went off exploring deeper in the cave. See that you do not go too far, Ariane told her. Some of these caves go very deep. It is easy to get lost. The princess lost another game of Sivas to Damon Sand, won one from Joss Hood, and then retired as the two of them began to teach Jane Ladybright the rules. She was tired of such games. Nim and Tyeen may have reached King's Landing by now, she mused, as she settled down cross-legged by the mouth of the cave to watch the falling rain. If not, they ought to be there soon. Three hundred seasoned spears had gone with them, over the boneway, past the ruins of Summerhall, and up the King's Road. If the Lannisters had tried to spring their little trap in the Kingswood, Lady Nim would have seen that it ended in disaster nor would the murderers have found their prey. Prince Tristane had remained safely back at Sunspear after a tearful parting from Princess Marcella. That accounts for one brother, thought Ariane. But where is Quentin, if not with the griffin? Had he wed his dragon queen? King Quentin. It still sounded silly. This new Daenerys Targaryen was younger than Ariane by half a dozen years. What would a maid that age want with her dull, bookish brother? Young girls dreamed of dashing knights with wicked smiles, 
not solemn boys who always did their duty. She will want Dorne, though. She hopes to sit the Iron Throne. She must have Sunspear. If Quinton was the price for that, this Dragon Queen would pay it. What if she was at Griffin's Roost with Connington, and all this about another Targaryen was just some sort of subtle ruse? Her brother could well be with her. King Quinton. Will I need to kneel to him? No good would come of wondering about it. Quinton would be king, or he would not. I pray Daenerys treats him more gently than she did her own brother. It was time to sleep. They had long leagues to ride upon the morrow. It was only as she settled down that Ariane realized Elia Sand had not returned from her explorations. Her sisters will kill me seven different ways if anything has happened to her. Jane Ladybright swore that the girl had never left the cave, which meant that she was still back there somewhere, wandering through the dark. When their shouts did not bring her forth, there was nothing to do but make torches and go in search of her. The cave proved much deeper than any of them had suspected. Beyond the stony mouth where her company had made their camp and hobbled their horses, a series of twisty passageways led down and down, with black holes snaking off to either side. Further in, the walls opened up again, and the searchers found themselves in a vast limestone cavern, larger than the great hall of a castle. Their shouts disturbed a nest of bats, who flapped about them noisily, but only distant echoes shouted back. A slow circuit of the hall revealed three further passages, one so small that it would have required them to proceed on hands and knees. We will try the others first, the princess said. Damon, come with me. Garibald, Joss, you try the other one. The passageway Ariane had chosen for herself turned steep and wet within a hundred feet. The footing grew uncertain. Once she slipped and had to catch herself to keep from sliding. More than once, she considered turning back, but she could see Sir Damon's torch ahead and hear him calling for Elia, so she pressed on. And all at once, she found herself in another cavern, five times as big as the last one, surrounded by a forest of stone columns. Damon's sand moved to her side and raised his torch. Look how the stone's been shaped, he said. Those columns, and the wall there, see them? Faces, said Ariane. So many sad eyes, staring. This place belonged to the children of the forest. A thousand years ago. More like to this very day. They are in a cave. And there are no spider webs in these tunnels. That seems to be a strong indicator that something, or more than likely many somethings, still live there. And their constant movement going up and down the tunnels prevents webs from being built that would and should be all over Ariane and her merry band of useless idiots if they hadn't. Then there's the forest of stone columns with faces on them. These seem very likely to be a quote-unquote forest of petrified weirwoods. That could give a whole new meaning to Maester Lewin's claim that the children of the forest lived in secret tree towns. Petrification is the process by which organic matter turns into stone, which would normally require that the objects be buried, and therefore deprived of oxygen, which is a necessary component of decay. But we know from Titus Blackwood that weirwoods are different, most likely because weirwood doesn't rot. Raventree Hall's weirwood has been quote-unquote dead for a thousand years, and Titus told Jamie that in another thousand years it will turn to stone. That, for all intents and purposes, tells us that weirwood petrifies without needing to be buried, which means weirwoods require only water for petrification to take place. And given that this cave is in the aptly named Rainwood, 
and it has an underwater river running beneath it, there is no lack of moisture in this cave to aid in the petrification process, which is something that we are going to expand on in a future video. Ariane turned her head. Listen, is that Joss? It was. The other searchers had found Elia, as she and Damon learned after they made their way back up the slippery slope to the last hall. Their passageway led down to a still black pool, where they discovered the girl up to her waist in water, catching blind white fish with her bare hands, her torch burning red and smoky in the sand where she had planted it. This perfectly parallels the cave where Bran and Bloodraven are. Under the hill, they still had food to eat. A hundred kinds of mushrooms grew down here. Blind white fish swam in the Black River, but they tasted just as good as fish with eyes once you cooked them up. They had cheese and milk from the goats that shared the caves with the singers. Even some oats and barley corn and dried fruit laid by during the long summer. The caves were timeless, vast, silent. They were home to more than three score living singers, and the bones of thousands dead, and extended far below the hollow hill. Men should not go wandering in this place, Leif warned them. The river you hear is swift and black, and flows down and down to a sunless sea. And there are passages that go even deeper, bottomless pits and sudden shafts, forgotten ways that lead to the very center of the earth. Even my people have not explored them all, and we have lived here for a thousand thousand of your man years. Then there is the legend of Gendel and Gorn, who invaded Westeros by going under the wall through a vast cavern system and came up on the other side. Caverns are formed by erosion caused by underground water. It appears that this sunless sea of black water and the cavern system it created stretches from Bran and Bloodraven's cave all the way down to this cave and likely goes even further, which is also likely how Leaf made it past the wall when she decided to walk amongst mankind for a few hundred years. You could have died, Ariane told her, when she'd heard the tale. She grabbed Elia by the arm and shook her. If that torch had gone out, you would have been alone in the dark as good as blind. What did you think that you were doing? I caught two fish, said Elia Sand. You could have died, said Ariane again. Her words echoed off the cavern walls. Died, died, died. Later, when they had made their way back to the surface and her anger had cooled, the princess took the girl aside and sat her down. Elia, this must end, she told her. We are not in Dorn now. You are not with your sisters, and this is not a game. I want your word that you will play the maidservant until we are safely back at Sunspear. I want you meek and mild and obedient. You need to hold your tongue. I'll hear no more talk of Lady Lance or jousting, no mention of your father or your sisters. The men that I must treat with are sellswords. Today they serve this man, who calls himself John Connington. But come the morrow, they could just as easily serve the Lannisters. All it takes to win a sellsword's heart is gold, and Casterly Rock does not lack for that. This once again shows how incredibly unprepared Ariane is for the mission that her father gave her. In her first pre-release chapter, she was forced to ask Damon Sand about John Connington, because she knew nothing about him which means Duran didn't tell her anything about the man that she was sent to treat with. Now here, she displays just how little she knows about the Golden Company, which is really odd because when she was back in Dorn, she seemed to know a bit more about them than she does now. But it really paints a vivid picture about how little Duran did to prepare her for the task he laid before her. What she just said might apply to every sellsword company in the story we know of, except the Golden Company, 
but they don't even call themselves sellswords. They refer to themselves as a brotherhood of exiles. John Connington said that discipline is the Golden Company's mother's milk, and the word of the Golden Company is as good as gold. Yet, Ariane seems to have forgotten all of this, and seems to regard them as common sellswords, no better than the bloody mummers. If the wrong man should learn who you are, you could be seized and held for ransom. No, Elia broke in. You're the one they'll want to ransom. You're the heir to Dorn. I'm just a bastard girl. Your father would give a chest of gold for you. My father's dead. Dead but not forgotten, said Ariane, who had spent half her life wishing Prince Oberon had been her father. You are a sand snake and Prince Doran would pay any price to keep you and your sister safe from harm. That made the child smile, at least. Do I have your sworn word, or must I send you back? I swear. Elia did not sound happy. On your father's bones? On my father's bones. That vow she will keep, Ariane decided. She kissed her cousin on the cheek and sent her off to sleep. Perhaps some good would come of her adventure. I never knew how wild she was till now, Ariane complained to Damon Sand afterward. Why would my father inflict her on me? Vengeance, the knight suggested with a smile. Does anyone else think that this really isn't the time or the place for Duran to be getting vengeance on his daughter for being a pain in his ass for most of her life? Nor is this a good time to try to teach her lessons. He just sent her on a dangerous journey with an uncertain welcome at its end, and there is exactly zero reason for a girl like Elia Sand to be there. Her presence is more likely to get Ariane killed than to be of any help, which is exactly where we'll be picking up next week.